Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can't? I like that. And welcome, welcome to our workshop. It's really good to see you here. And partly because this is that lovely time of the afternoon when some people around the world uh, take a siesta. We're, we've done our best to plan this time so that you will not be tempted to do so. Uh, my name is Deb Organ. I come from uh, Minneapolis, Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis, and I am involved in, uh, I teach at the St. Catherine University there. I mostly practical theology, sometimes other stuff. And I am pastoral associate of Holy Rosary Parish in South Minneapolis, which right now is about 90% first generation Latino immigrants. And I'm a mental health clinician with my practice there in the parish. So it's great to, it's great to be with you today. This looks like a pandemic. Perfect. OK, great. I'm Susan McGurgan. I'm from the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. I direct the lay pastoral ministry program there. I'm an assistant professor of pastoral theology um, at the Athenaeum of Ohio, which is the Catholic seminary there. I teach evangelization and church history to lay people. And I teach homiletics to, to permanent deacons uh, seeking their Sunday preaching faculties. So we're going to begin looking at mighty words from creative spaces. And I want to start off by telling you a story. And it's a story of a nun who ran away to join the circus. She is a missionary sister of the most sacred heart of Jesus. And she spent 16 years as a missionary in Papua New Guinea. And when that call ended, she found herself at a bit of loose ends. And so she began to explore different options with her community. And over the course of two or three years, at first very reluctantly, and then with a lot of trepidation, and then finally with great joy, she began to embrace a, a call to minister to some of the 4,000 people who live and work in circuses in the United States. 40% of these people are Catholic. Okay? And so what she discovered along the way was the journey of the migrant worker is never just geographical, but it's also spiritual. And that these people who live and, and work and entertain us in these circuses live out a lot of these ancient metaphors of faith, um, the metaphor of the journey, uh, the metaphor of the wilderness, and of transformation, transforming something very ordinary into something uh, magical and mysterious. Robert Lax, who's a, uh, a theologian and who also worked in a circus for a time, said this. He said, by day from town to town, we carry Eden in our tents and bring its wonders to the children who've lost their dream of home. So ministers in these traveling shows uh, are under the auspices of the USCCB for the Secretariat of Cultural Diversity. But they, they do not minister full time. In fact, they, they have to be, they're required to be full time workers in the surface and circus. And so Sister Dorothy became a teamster. And so she would put up the tent in an empty field. She would help put up the tent in an empty field and transform a, a parking space or a hard packed ground into a place of wonder overnight. Or she would stand at the main curtain and in the darkness she would open and close the curtain up to 100 times in an evening. A lot of times in the afternoon she would find herself working at the ticket booth. And so this ticket booth would be at the crossroads of this busy space, this temporary city that had emerged overnight. And she was new. And although she was very busy and although she was very happy, she really started to wonder when her ministry would begin. When would she get the opportunity to proclaim the gospel? And when would she get the opportunity to share faith with people? She used to sense sometimes that people wanted to stop and talk to her, but they never did. They would hurry by. They would hurry on their way in the afternoon to the riggings or the costuming shop or wherever they needed to be. And so one day they pulled into a new town, and Sister Dorothy unhitched her truck from her RV where she lived, and she drove into town. And she went to a few different shops until she found what she wanted. And what she found was a very comfortable, padded folding chair. And she took that back, 
and she opened it up and she placed it next to the ticket booth. And from that time, the chair was never empty. And so her ministry began. Pitch the tent, set up a stone altar, call out the name of Yahweh. Let God be present and may his face shine upon us. And when you found them, please sit down. Okay, thank you. Now, what we'd like to invite you to do is spend the next 10 minutes, and we're going to be time hounds here because we don't have a very long time for the entire workshop, so we'll be watching the time. You don't have to worry. But we'd like you to spend 10 minutes talking with each other about what the story of Sister Dorothy evoked in you first. And then, where have you seen the proclamation of the word taking place in unexpected spaces such as that padded chair? Those are the two questions. First, what did the story of Sister Dorothy evoke in you? Then, where have you seen this? And let the stories come. Where have you witnessed this kind of proclamation of the word in unexpected spaces? Okay.
you. I'm going to invite you to begin to wrap up your conversations. Here's his arm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So making that space accessible mm -hmm. and comfortable and inviting. Yes. I was struck with all of that, but also with the realization that so many times our ministry and mission in life doesn't turn out to be at all what we thought. That God is truly in charge. struck, well, for me to think about it, uh, the differences. Um, for myself, <clears throat> I have to say that I don't envision myself at all being involved in the ministry that Dorothy was. Not in the ministry of spreading the word, but in the ministry of using the medium of circus. I could never do that. So I have to ask myself, all right then, God, where are my gifts and how can I do it? Uh, and I mean, I should know by now, but... <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a journey. <laughs> it's a journey. So I have to capitalize on what I know. I think as a pretty strong introvert, 
I can kind of connect uh, in one way. One of the things I've learned as an introvert, uh, one of my things I find most difficult is to go into a room of strangers and engage in conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can put myself in that chair there and think, you know, she saw the person sit, and the way to engage in conversation is to ask questions about them. Mm -hmm. I see, you know, how's your day going? What do you do here at the circus? And suddenly that leads, and that's where I think God's there, he leads into it by that conversation we heard about in one of our keynotes. That stranger, you know, how do you engage the stranger? How do you welcome the stranger? How do you make space? You to, and how do you listen? You have to ask. Listen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Sometimes people very, you know, uh, purposely make spaces so that people won't hang out there. You know, yes. so um, so there is no chair in, in the way things. And you say, well, could this be? Well, no, really, we don't. We don't want people hanging out here. So you know, what are the spaces where we minister? What are some spaces to make them? more hospitable. Mm -hmm. um, so when you talk about evangelizing parish, it's 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 also the the furniture, mm -hmm. what's on the bulletin board, um, are there's candy on the desk, um, who greets them. You know, all those kinds of things are important to open up that preaching conversation. Or not. Or You're not. absolutely right. <laughs> or not. Our space allocation, right. just like a, a budget. A budget is a theological statement. Our space allocation is also a theological statement. It says what do we value and what do we believe in. And if we don't believe in empty chairs, then there will be no space for them. Yeah. So these proclamations, or this proclamation of Sister Dorothy and maybe the other proclamations that you've seen, heard, and made in, in your lives are conversations, some in, they involve an intentionality in a certain sense, but sometimes they're surprises. God's in charge. There's an openness to hospitality as shown by accessible and comfortable spaces. Questions, listening, what's needed, knowing people. All of these things go in to the mighty proclamation of the word in unexpected places. And this didn't just begin with Sister Dorothy and didn't just begin with us. Women have been creating spaces for proclamation since the beginning of the church. Women have been preaching and proclaiming the gospel in the Christian tradition from the earliest moments, from Magdalene's go and tell through today. Um, diversity of ministries, diversity of roles, locations for proclamation. This tradition is deeply embedded, and yet it's a tradition that we rarely teach. Um, we have come to believe in the 20th century that the only place for proclamation is in the pulpit on a Sunday. But a cursory look at our history says that proclamation occurs in empty chairs everywhere, and in places and in creative spaces that men and women, but particularly women, have created through the years. Women's proclamation has been uh, accorded authority by looking at it through the lens of prophecy, by looking at it through the connections between proclamation and mission, evangelization, through the connections between proclamation and catechesis, through corrections against heretical teaching, mission, private teaching, song that uh, Sister Jamie mentioned in her talk. Uh, several women, very prominently in the Middle Ages, had an enormous preaching ministry that was sanctioned by the church because they weren't preaching, they were singing, you know, an exhortation. The reality is women have never been silent. And although their voices were heard frequently in the Middle Ages, um, there was a real flourishing of preaching in the Middle Ages, and women were definitely part of that. The era of time that we think of as the Dark Ages during the fall of the Roman Empire was certainly not dark for many of the women who were powerful leaders of, of uh, monasteries and, and abbeys and who proclaimed the word and went fearlessly into mission territory uh, preaching and teaching. One of the groups that really caught my attention was the French Ursulines uh, right after the Reformation 
who developed um, an incredibly powerful preaching ministry uh, because they worked in the area of catechesis. This was at a time in France when mass attendance was very low. There were a lot of local dialects. Pastoral care was very difficult for that region. People were very poorly catechized, and the newly formed Ursulines moved into that very fluid land between proclamation and um, teaching and catechesis. And they would teach after mass to very, very large mixed groups, and they taught in barnyards and poultry yards, and they stood on boxes in town squares, and they would gather these huge groups around them, and their eloquence and their passion and their zeal for teaching um, really did become preaching and proclamation. They were very, they were very um, powerfully engaged in the metaphor of preaching. And that became one of the central metaphors of their charism at that time, and it, it can be seen throughout their writings. Uh, they really saw their mission as being aligned with John the Baptist, and they, they very um, uh, powerfully moved in that area. They were very much in support of the broader goals of the church and the mission of the church, and they really saw their ministry as one that helped people come back to the church and helped people engage in the works of the church more fruitfully because they were better educated. So accepted were they in this that uh, one of the women preached uh, to the future king of France and to the papal nuncio who later became Urban VIII. So they very much saw this, they saw a continuum between the household and private and public uh, works and a f very fluid boundary between catechesis and preaching. Um, they really stood on that boundary and created, were very creative in making a space for women's voices to be heard. They were forced into enclosure. They were forced to, to go into uh, enclosed uh, convents but they did not see that as a liability. In fact, they continued to preach and to teach through the grill and saw that although their physical space might be limited, the power of their voices was not. And it's the examples of women like this that we need to recapture in our tradition and to share with um, all of the people in our community.
in all my years and certainly as powerful as those I heard in the seminary classroom when I was teaching homiletics. Some of those are powerful too, but these come in these kinds of spaces. And I think we have to see across the world how important these spaces are. They're not just auxiliary or ancillary or extra. They're actually central to the mission of the church. We're gathered here at this conference to talk about preaching and evangelization. Usually the first word that brings somebody into contact with the ecclesial community or brings somebody back into contact with the ecclesial community after an absence of some sort is going to be a word spoken in a space like the padded chair or the community center or on the mountain. We're in those spaces. They're deeply ecclesial. They're all over the world. And they've always existed. Their power, while sometimes perhaps not brought to articulation or recognized, has been immense in influencing how the church has lived, grown, spread, been enculturated and, and has participated in the transformation not only of those of us who choose to be in ecclesial communion but in the transformation of the world. Because these spaces usually aren't ends in themselves. Probably if we were to sit in on a day of Sister Dorothy's life in the, in the padded chair some of those moments of proclamation that happen there, those, those encounters, those conversations, I have to imagine lead to change in families. Maybe they, maybe they lead to change in, in vocational decisions. Probably another lens through which to look at these spaces would be for each of us to consider our own vocation story. What have been the most the most um, transformational spaces that we've been in with people. When have they proclaimed to us and awakened that, that sense of the indwelling God who calls us to the power of transformation of ourselves in the world and to the deep intimacy of loving that calls us to understand and know in the way we can the communion from which we come and to which we're moving. These spaces are powerful and important. And I was really happy to hear that. Well, I, I, I think maybe that was intentional, may have been my word, but that was what I heard coming from the, the uh, from your comments. And, and so we're going to turn now to looking at all right, if we, if we acknowledge that these spaces are powerful, important, essential, essential for evangelization, and pertaining to the nature of the church, then what are some things that we can be and do in order to intentionally form people for these spaces, um, for, for the proclamation that happens in these spaces, and uh, find and form the spaces themselves? So we would argue that we need to broaden our lens for preaching, that we need to broaden what we view as proclamation in preaching, and to be deliberate about forming people and creating those spaces. Um, so how do we form people? And um, we'll give you an opportunity to give some suggestions too later. Um, I think one of the most important things we can do is to present the tradition in its entirety. Um, make our claim for the tradition of women's voices proclaiming the word, appeal to tradition, ensure that people know these stories, use the exemplars of these powerful and mighty women in history who proclaimed the gospel in unexpected and surprising places, um, oftentimes with the full support of the church behind them. Uh, we've been present from the beginning, so reclaim that and embody that history. I think we need to value the importance of theological education and formation 
for women, both formal theological education and the informal mentoring and theological education that takes place through small faith communities. And to realize the power that lies in <coughs> RCIA groups and small Christian communities. Uh, those are powerful places for forming women to proclaim the word. Um, listen to people's stories. And be ready to name what you hear as proclamation of the gospel. Um, help people see the connections between their lives and the pastoral mystery. I think so often um, we fail to kind of close that loop because we don't name what we've heard as transformational and as proclamation of the gospel. So as you listen to people's stories, help them see, help them articulate what it is that they're sharing. I think women need to be very proactive in mentoring other women. In my doctoral work, I interviewed women in Cincinnati who preach, and one of the questions I asked them was, who were your preaching mentors? And then, who have you mentored? And although almost all of them talked in great passion and detail about the people who had mentored them, only two of them had mentored other women in preaching. And I think that if, if we want to, um, to keep those voices alive, we need to be very proactive in helping give birth to those voices, helping bring those voices out. I think you need to help people also view their lives and their experiences with a homiletic eye. You know, um, once you have that homiletic lens, you walk through life and there are homilies stuck all over you. You know, I had one old preaching teacher who said, like, burrs on a coon dog, you know. It's just like you can't walk through life once you have that lens without seeing sermons and homilies unfold in front of you time and time again. Um, cultivate that inner life. St. Bernard said, if you want to be a channel, you must first be a reservoir. So cultivate that inner life and help other people cultivate that inner life. Another important thing I think, and I, and I, I think this is something we don't do enough of, is to appreciate the creativity and the power of the marginal spaces. We tend to look at marginal spaces as something always negative. Uh, the desert experience, always negative. Well, there's a lot of life in the desert, if you have eyes to see. Marginal places have an element of liminality about them. They can be harsh at times, but there's also that sense of the potential for something new to be born. There's a lot of freedom in the marginal spaces, and there's a lot of power in that freedom um, and I think that places along the margins uh, can be filled with potential and they can be filled with new life. Uh, psychologists and scientists um, have done a lot of studies on creativity and one of the counterintuitive things that they've discovered is that restrictions actually foster creativity. Dr. Seuss wrote Green Eggs and Ham on a dare from a publisher who said he couldn't write a successful book using 50 words. And those restrictions flowered his creativity. Okay, So explore that link um, and embrace the life in the margins as, um, as life-giving because that's where the people that we're trying to evangelize live. Affirm the goodness and the faithfulness of women who proclaim the word. Uh, throughout history, people who have attacked women who proclaim the word usually attack not the message, but the person and the character of the person. And we can do a lot to foster those voices by affirming their goodness and their faithfulness and their help for the church. Of these spaces. But what else is there? I just want to 
invite you just for a couple minutes. We're not giving you 10 minutes this time. But if you could turn to the people sitting near you that are in your group, could you talk about what else is needed? How else can we uh, form and support this broader lens of a preaching ministry in these unexpected spaces? Just for two or three minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. So that's why I'm having them do this, so I can bring in some of what they say and then finish well, with what hasn't been said yet. Yeah. Always the so it'll be all right. We're interested to hear what you, what you have to say about this. What kinds of things are necessary to form toward this broader vision of preaching? I don't know if you're part. Oh, sure. So it's just trying to pull in some of what you're talking about. What's necessary to form toward, especially form women, toward this broader vision of, uh, of preaching and proclamation? Diane. Yeah. I would say start young. What I'm struck by is, is what um, there's a high school, Dominican high school preaching conference annually. There's a Dominican college preaching conference annually. And it is amazing what happens to those Students. And those groups are dominantly women. It, it's a mix, it's uh -huh. just, um, both men and women, but it's women. And I think uh, to know that that kind of structure, that kind of experience, really is formative and transformative. And it bonds them and it, it uh, gives them courage for their, their word. But, and it occurs to me, too, that they. Right, they would also see others proclaiming. 
that that's a that's a that's a wonderful uh, thing. Yes. Going along with that, perhaps talking to our grandchildren, our children, our nieces, our nephews about the lives of great women saints. You know uh, how they were formed and what things they did throughout their life that were things of courage. You know, Saint Teresa of Avila, Catherine of Siena. You know, many of them. Mother Teresa. Right, yeah. The, putting the putting the role models in there. Yeah. I think a lot about this. I think it's it's uh, really important for us to acknowledge and affirm uh, girls for who they are, because the peer pressure is so great in their lives, and the beauty of being a woman and a girl at the age that she is, and to grow with them. And would helping her to find her voice be a piece of that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And Nora? Yeah. Uh, when there's an opportunity for us to plan programs, plan them so that mass is not necessarily essential and women preachers can be uh, heard. And uh, someone commented that last year at this time we had women preachers at the last conference that was given here. And we miss them now because we don't have morning prayer. Right. Fair yeah. enough. So yeah. if that's uh -huh. something that is of interest to people, perhaps we could say so. Um, in terms of the starting young, I am the witness of young women who have been at the high school conference coming back to school and preaching and knocking the socks off the priests who are presiding on mass and inspiring the girls in the school. It's just, it's, it's remarkable. So it's not just those eight or those 10, it's now 300. Yeah, yeah. I was saying it kind of along the lines of it from the girls, um, and it might be the circles I run in, but there's a way to affirm that it's not set up against what you're not. Exactly. There's, there's an awful lot of, I, I don't, you, and like I said, maybe it's just the circles I run in, but, but it, more often than not, it's, I am because I'm not. And so to be able okay. to affirm for what I am, for the sake that, no, I, I've got God-given gifts and, and a way to express them. And, um, to define for, for oneself. For no yeah. Uh -huh. Just as me. Right. Yes. Uh -huh. that, that seems core. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you going to say well, something, Kathy? Well, to piggyback off that and that, that not only to do that to young girls, but we need to do it to young boys because they're being taught the same falsehoods about themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if we want to change the world, we have to change the whole world and not just the little girls. The boys are being brought up to think that to be uh, in this mold that we're kind of set up for. So I think we need to include them. Thank you. Yes, well. absolutely. It's a very good point. Yeah. Jen. One of the margins I think that we find ourselves at quite often is the margin of pain and suffering and illness. And the way we preach usually in those situations is by compassion and care. That words do not necessarily need to be said. They can be, but uh, there have been so many of us who have been in situations like that, and a great, a great deal of gospeling has gone on. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh -huh. And if we can name that, that can help us broaden the lens in terms of what the proclamation is in in our community. I think to to uh, uh, said, make opportunities. Uh, for the variety of, of preaching. And public preaching, as we know, is not just a homily on Sunday. So things like morning prayer and so we're at events, instead of complaining, well, we can't preach here, there's tremendous opportunity. And when people get up and give testimony or anything, to be able to name that as a preaching. I mean, I yes. do a lot of presentations. Mm -hmm. I, for me, they're preaching events. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to name them that and encourage not just for the sake of women, but for the sake of the whole, uh, whole church. The whole church. Yeah. And I think even within our setting, there's so many opportunities that people can share the word. But we have to create it and train people, because then that's the other thing. People say, well, this 
can't have eulogies because people go on and on. Well, you can't just say, get up and give a talk. You've got to spend the time right. to mentor and to train people. Also, the proclamation of the scriptures as, as a preaching. Uh, this mm -hmm. past Easter vigil, Mary Ann Collins is some of you know, uh, she's a sister, and she's a chaplain in a prison, women's prison, and actually preaches every week. But so for Easter, for Holy Saturday, I was there with her and had one of the women who were baptized get up and give testimony. It was incredible. This woman was a prison guard in another prison, Baptist. But anyway, it was street water. Well, what are you going to do, right? So, anyway. <laughs> but anyway, tells her story and what a, you know, what a proclamation. I mean, tremendous preaching. To be able to name it and call it that. So, um, there's plenty of ways that we can facilitate others in our roles of preaching besides ourselves. And not talk about so much what we can do. Absolutely. And claim our power to make it happen, both in public places and conversations in all sorts of situations. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, and this may be less of um, an issue for my sisters who work with the sisters in the room, but, you know, I think one of the things for me in my setting, which is, you know, right now I don't have a location. Um, I'm not teaching. I'm not, you know, working in a parent or whatever, is to be willing to be seen for my faith. You know, when I think about the people who proclaim the gospel to me, I think of my Irish immigrant grandmothers whose faith was constantly spoken about. It was either on display through their prayer cards, <laughs> or it was them telling a story or assuring me that Jesus would be with me or whatever. And I think, like, as I was listening to Christian Smith this morning about how, you know, there's this kind of blurry, moralistic, therapeutic, soft culture that sort of blends religion for young people. And to be willing to say, you know, I, I stand in this spot that I'm in, as I am right now, totally trusting that God is taking me where I'm meant to go. Totally believing that Jesus would not have called me and equipped me if there wasn't something for me to do. And when I say that, I actually am very present to how utterly bizarre that is. For a lot of people. Yes. You know, really. It really is, you know. And yet, you know, what is the pontiff? The pontiff is the one who builds the bridge. So we have to figure out how our lives become the bridge for the people who don't, can't, to demonstrate you can connect the story to my experience. My life illuminates the story, and the story illuminates my life. And you just proclaimed the Paschal Mystery in the midst of this community. And thank you for doing And yet I also want to affirm the importance uh -huh. of the visible role of those of us who have been gifted with being in a public preaching ministry. Because Deb and I know each other from the Archdiocese. You know, I preached in the Sunday Assembly for nine years. And there's this cluster of these young women who grew up in my parish who were suddenly seeking me out. They're in their like they're like 26, 27, 28. And I'm running into them in like Walgreens or whatever. And suddenly they're saying things to me like, Trish, I don't I I should have a spiritual home, but I don't fit a pox, and I don't know where, you know, and they're looking to me now. So had I not had that public place to, to stand in the community and to serve the community as, as witness, and I'm breaking up the word, then, I, then, then also I would be in this place to help these women. So it's, I think it's a both end. It is, and it, it and actually, thank you for a, a marvelous segue into a, a piece that I, tell them you I think is really <laughs> important in terms of how we even look at the ministry of preaching. I mean, just the sacramentality of our faith tradition means that anything can be relevatory of the sacred and of the mystery of God, right? If we really believe that. We have to come from this place of knowing that sometimes the proclamations of life out of death come from places that seem impossible. And yet, and yet, it's what, it, it's what we're all about. And so sometimes the spaces that we're going to create and invite people into and step into ourselves, 
we can't necessarily even see the next step, but we can trust that we're a part of the revelation of God in the world during our time. Like when I think of the first Beguines, okay, these, these, you know, these women who they were given a choice, okay, you got the cloister, you can get married and have your husband control you. Which one do you want? And some of them were, well, gee, I think I'm going to go for option C here, okay? And they ended up stepping out and were, are often na named as the first pastoral ministers who introduced catechetics in the vernacular, okay? These women. And they rode under the radar screen for quite some time, and, uh, you know, intentionally. And probably when they were doing it, they couldn't have imagined that several hundred years later, somebody would be standing in a classroom in the University of Notre Dame and talking about how they were the proclaimers of the word, some of the, the they, giving birth to that reality of uh, the proclamation of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in their time in a way that would have implications that would last till today, and that as a pastoral minister, I could look to them as the first who had exercised that role, at least in European circles. So we might not know where it's going, but to trust in where we have our feet planted. And I think you brought up some really important things here, just to kind of tie it together as we're moving to close, is um, what, what's needed, what's needed, and what can we do? What can we do? The energy going into that. And... Uh, and then trusting that whatever that is, is going to continue to, to transform us, the church, and, and the world moving forward. And, and there were just, uh, Susan, did you want to add any more right now, or should we move to the last things? Yeah, we can move to the last things, I think. Yeah. We just, we kind of had four carryaways that <laughs> we wanted to really to take uh, with you from, uh, from this workshop. Yeah, we, um, when we looked at this through history, one of the things we noticed is that women's proclamation is most effective and uh, seems to flourish uh, when it emerges um, not from a sense of this is my right or by what authority do I preach, but rather emerges from the real needs of the people and meeting a real need. Um, so that it's less about, about ego and, and privilege and more about meeting the needs of the people. Uh, the Barna Group did a recent study of Catholics and Protestants and asked them, what do you hope for uh, when you go to church? And 64% said they hoped for an encounter with Christ. And 6% said that, that that happened for them. You know, there's a, there's a lot of opportunities for preaching and evangelization, and there are a lot of real needs um, out in the community. Um, so women's voices flourish when it's about need and not about privilege. And when it brings people to the church, there is a, a deeply ecclesial quality to this that I think uh, we cannot overemphasize in that this type of proclamation should bring people to the community, bring people to the sacraments, to a deeper relationship with Christ, to that encounter with Christ that people long for and so infrequently get uh, in, our, in our church services. So it should be um, bringing people to the church, bringing people to the sacraments, engaging in that mission of the church, uh, the, the theme of this conference is evangelization, uh, you know, go and preach to all the world. And that is, I think, where our gifts lie and where our call is. The third thing that we want to emphasize is that women's proclamation of the gospel has always happened. We're standing on solid ground here. When I started out preaching, I... I thought this was this new thing for women. And I was, nine, I was 18 or something. But come to find over the years, just over time, that uh, collaboration of men and women and the, uh, the preaching 
and proclamation of women has always been part of the reality of the church, and we're carrying on that tradition. Okay. Then the fourth thing is that no one has to allow anyone else to define us. We get to listen to who we are in the core of our being, and of course the formative the formative influences around us are going to impact how that process goes. And a lot of your comments about working with young people, creating spaces, forming people for ministry play to that. So naturally, we have an effect on one another. And yet, we get to decide who and what defines us. Any of us does. Now, we've talked a lot today about sacred spaces. And I'd like to invite you into one with a poem. This is by. Harold Recinos, who wrote Good News from the Barrio, Prophetic Witness for the Church. It's a, it's a nice piece, and uh, uh, the poetry that he has in it is really quite lovely. Every few pages, he's got a piece. Here's one. It's called Games. I saw children playing on the corner wearing smiles that old prayers often bid for the whole block. Abuelitas come out of tired buildings to sit on stoops tying unlaced sneakers with wrinkled hands made before time. They looked up smiling at the old man with stories that cough up on all the corners loud enough to raise blinds and open eyes in all the windows. Kids who think games never end made the street sing a babble of fun that left imprints on the crowds on the well-kept sidewalks. We drew nearer to the truth that Sabado afternoon simply to drink it still. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we would welcome any comments in the next few minutes or your feedback or any. Uh, I think we go till 4.30, right? Is that correct? I think so, but people were letting people folks were out letting early folks this out morning, early, so, so don't free know. to go. But Deb and I will be here if you, if you <laughs> yeah. have any comments or, or um, thoughts for us. So thank you very much.